Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome everyone back or welcome you for the first time if you're just joining us now. I'm Rabbi Landsberg of Temple Emmanuel. It is our delight and our pleasure to be hosting this series of learning with Josh Scharf. Before I turn it over to um, Lee for the more formal introduction, I just want to do uh, make a couple of tech points. Number one, um, chat is going to host and co-host. If you have comments or questions, send them in the chat. I'll be monitoring that through the course and your questions will go right to Josh today. If you have longer term questions, please, next week's session is uh, Colbo. <laughs> it's all your questions, everything. And so if you have questions that you want to make sure are answered, send them to me. Feel free to email me today or tomorrow rabbi at templeemmanuel.ca. Get rabbi at templeemmanuel.ca. You can access it on our website if you don't remember that. And I'd be happy, I'll just forward them directly onto Josh so he'll have time to integrate your questions and concerns into our final session next week to, uh, together. No, two weeks from now together. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> um, I know it is 1030 Toronto time, which means Sunday morning, we are ready to start our learning. That's what I know about time. And so with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Lee to get us started. Great. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, you're in for a delightful learning opportunity that will uh, challenge you. and. Um, on behalf of Arts of Canada, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Landsberg and Temple Emmanuel for generally spo generously sponsoring and hosting this uh, session. And um, we continue our, uh, our journey of learning with uh, Josh Scharf. Josh is an American Israeli Jewish educator. He's currently pursuing rabbinical ordination at the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. He's also completing his master's degree in Jewish history at the Hebrew University. Uh, Josh also works as the development resource and external relations coordinator at Big Danielle Synagogue for Progressive Judaism in Tel Aviv. Uh, Josh, I wanna thank you for being with us and for leading us in understanding the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Rabbi. Again, uh, it's great to be here with everyone today. Um, just a, a quick tech note of my own. I am on uh, a PC, which is odd for me. I'm I'm a, I'm a, an Apple guy. So if there's just a few clicks, uh, uh, the, the transitions between screen sharing are a little bit less smooth today. Um, just so that you know that that's uh, that's what's going on here. Um, uh, it's great to be back here. I want to thank everyone for your, your really wonderful questions that you've been sending. Um, uh, they've really, I really use them to shape the information that I bring during our first three sessions together, really talking about the history, bringing us up till today. And then as um, Rabbi mentioned, um, next week we'll be in uh, really diving into sort of the, some of the hot topic issues of today. So really thank you for, for your questions. Um, what we're doing this week. What we're going to do this week is move from the 1990s up until today. Really talk about the last 30 years um, um, and talk about um, the peace process um, and, and where that all has brought us to um, today and really talk about the situation we're in, um, the, sort of the, the facts on the ground as they are now, um, which will give us hopefully um, a great deal of context to be able to dive in next week to these uh, more um, Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Lee. Uh, in two weeks, um, uh, that will be able to um, guide us um, in um, uh, getting some insight into these these um, these more complex issues, um, questions such as apartheid um, uh, settlements and and, and um, um, indigeneity and things of, of this sort. So, um, just a couple of thoughts for last week, so we, we get back on the same page together. Um, uh, we spoke a lot about borders last week. Um, the changing borders of, of the state of Israel uh, changed the conflict in, in myriad ways, um, especially after uh, the Six Day War, when Israel um, comes in possession of uh, a huge amount of territory, the Golan Heights, um, the Gaza Strip and Sinai, um, and, and uh, the West Bank. Um, of course, we discussed in 79 that Israel, um, it's still for peace with Egypt, returns the Sinai Peninsula. 
Um, before, we also talked about how the conflict has, it, it's looked different at different times. Um, from 1948 to 1973, which is up to the Yom Kippur War, it's very much an Israeli-Arab conflict. Many of the countries in this area, beyond just the Israelis and the Palestinians, are uh, caught up in this conflict. After 73, and especially after peace in 79 with Egypt, where the first Arab state, and not only Arab state, Egypt at the time, which is the leader of uh, the, the Arab world, um, normalizing with, with Israel, um, reshaped the conflict and brought the focus down really to what was going on, on the ground um, in Israel and, and the Palestinian territories, to use um, a uh, more neutral political term for, for these, these, uh, these areas. Um, First Intifada, where we left off last week, um, 1987 to 1993, really brings the reality of Palestinians to the fore here in Israel. Um, it, it, it was, a, it was a, um, an issue that sort of had, had, had lost its, its place in the central focus, and all of a sudden it comes storming back. And um, during this time, 87 to 93, the world underwent some incredible changes. Um, the, the, the Soviet Union collapses, the United States of America emerges as the one global superpower from this, um, and, and these political winds move together where Yasser Arafat's PLO um, was able to change its position uh, and move towards normalizing with Israel. Um, an Israeli government that will be uh, led by um, Yitzhak Rabin, a uh, former uh, general for uh, decades and defense minister in the uh, uh, Israeli security forces, um, Israeli security services um, becomes prime minister on, on, a, on running on a platform of, of pursuing peace. And in the United States, um, Bill Clinton is elected uh, president in 1992 and, is his, and puts his administration in a position to be very involved in, in the Middle East. Um, it's, it's an issue that's very close um, to, to Clinton's heart um, and, and his administration work um, um, and, extremely hard on this issue. And all of these things move together to push Isra Israel, Israel and Palestinian representatives uh, to um, begin secret talks in Norway and Oslo. And, um, and this leads to the, the Oslo Accords. This first set of, um, um, it's, a, it's a set of resolutions uh, with no, uh, which didn't, they don't, ex they don't include an explicit promise that at the end of this, there'll be a Palestinian state, but this is the understanding. This is a blueprint in the direction of peace, of normalization, of mutual recognition. Um, Oslo won, and I'll share um, a, uh, a screen here from, uh, with me. Can, Lee, can you give me a, a, a you see this? Image, yes, okay. So very famously, this is um, Yasser Arafat, the president, uh, the chairman of the, the PLO on the right, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin on the left, President Bill Clinton in the middle, uh, the, the lawn of the White House, shaking hands, um, signing um, uh, the first Oslo Accord. This is a huge deal that these two leaders shook hands. There's so much, uh, so much hatred and, and, and so much had gone on during the past decades that this was truly a breakthrough moment. The, the Oslo Accords themselves, right, Oslo won in 1993, it included some important things. First of all, the Palestinians, for the first time, recognized Israel as a, as a state with, with a legitimacy to exist. And in return, the Israeli government um, gave recognition to the PLO as the representative body of the Palestinian people. This is, you know, we, we talk about it can seem unimportant, but the fact that in public these statements are made is a huge push forward because for decades the policy of many Arab nations was to say uh, that this that we do not recognize Israel. It is not legitimate, and therefore we don't need to accept it as a reality here in the Middle East. And so this is a sea change. Um, it's it's um, it also so this this first set of agreements starts to pave the way to. It really is just the beginning of the beginning. It, it sets a, 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 a group of standards on which future talks will be held over a series of years. The Oslo Accords have effects beyond just the, the Palestinian the issue. In 1994, Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, the second Arab nation to do so, um, and normalizes uh, relations. Um, it was somewhat of a badly kept secret that Jordan and Israel were decently close allies. Um, and finally, they, um, they, they came to recognize uh, each other 
in peace. Um, and, and this sort of caught the moment of a general optimism at the time, a real feeling that something was shifting, right? this, this post um, this post Cold War era, this um, very much, if people remember sort of this iconic song, the, win the winds of change that, that, come, that comes out in the, the early 90s, and, and this really feeling where there can be something new, a breakthrough, something meaningful. People remember the days of the 70s where if you had suggested that Israel and Egypt could ever have a peace treaty, they would have laughed you out of the room, but, but here we were, and, and here we are um, I'm moving forward. And alongside this optimism through 93, 94, um, is we're starting something new. There's also violence. Um, the, while the, the intensity of the first intifada subsided, um, Israelis started experiencing a new type of political violence used um, by um, uh, Palestinian factions, um, specifically Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, both of which will come up again later today, who they opposed Oslo. They, they, they weren't willing to give any sort of um, territorial compromise to Israel. And, you, and we see the first um, suicide bombings launched in this year, nothing like uh, what will come in, in uh, later years. But um, so while peace is being worked on and, and spoken about and discussed, we, there, at the same time, there, there's, there's another, um, there's another um, something growing um, underneath uh, uh, the surface. Um, but still in 1995, the second Oslo Accord is signed and ratified. And, and this very importantly sets up and sets the a basis for, for future Palestinian administration of in the West Bank. It, it breaks up, among other things, the West Bank into three areas. The light blue um, parts of the, uh, of the map are area C. This is an area entirely under Israeli uh, civil and military control. Um, the uh, white areas are um, area B, which are split control, Palestinian civil and Israeli military, and then the, air, the darkest area, shaded areas, are areas A. And these are um, completely Palestinian operated, both military and civilian um, control. And we'll come back to this later, but it's important for, for us to get this visual when speaking about um, the final status agreements um, about perhaps the, the uh, creation of a Palestinian state. Um, and this was, this was one of the steps in working in that, in that direction. Um, up until um, 1995 in November, um, on November 4th, 1995, as uh, Shabbat went out here in, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, not far from where I sit now, um, the Prime Minister at the time, Yitzhak Rabin, held a rally in what was then called Kings of Israel Square, um, and um, brought up hundreds, it was the largest um, rally in Israel's history, and brought up hundreds of thousands of people, um, and sadly, in the wake, as he, as he moved away from the ceremony and, and uh, was moving on to his next uh, Next appointment, um, he was assassinated uh, by, uh, uh, by a Jewish Israeli. And what happens is, um, and, and it, it, it happens very rapidly, that Rabin was this core, this, this, sort, of, um, this sort of star that people of, of a lot of different political um, um, backgrounds could uh, unite around. Um, and when he, um, when he was assassinated, when he died, um, that that was lost, that sort of power um, um, player in the government was lost. Um, and um, Shimon Peres, who was, um, uh, to use a, a modern term, uh, Yitzhak Rabin's long-term frenemy, uh, they were both uh, political allies, but um, it was well known they didn't always get along one with, one with the other. Um, he, uh, Peres, uh, calls another election to try to um, strengthen the peace bloc. Um, but what happens is this, completely backfires on him. Um, during the election campaign, there was uh, an out and up swing in violence. Um, and it brought in, uh, when the election came, it brought in uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party for the first time um, into power. And then from 1996 to 1999, during this Netanyahu government, um, things um, weren't able to hold on the same way. Um, you know, both the, with recriminations from both sides of reneging on agreements or this, that, and the other. Um, I'm not going to dive too too deep into these years because we just need to keep moving forward. Um, but three years later, uh, three years of a, of a Likud-led Netanyahu government end in um, the situation in Lebanon, which we haven't which we haven't even mentioned the Lebanon war here. I don't think 
Israel had been, um, Israeli troops had been in uh, Lebanese territory since 1982. Um, young men and women were still being killed um, as this war of attrition went on. Um, the public opinion was turning against very harshly. Um, Netanyahu was, had some uh, uh, scandal in his personal life at the time. And uh, when uh, new elections were called, Ehud Barak brings labor back, the left wing, uh, prime left wing party at the time, uh, brings labor back on a on a promise to finish the peace process, to finish what we started, uh, which brought um, and which brought Ehud Barak, uh, Bill Clinton, and um, uh, Yasser Arafat to Camp David in July of uh, 2000, with the goal to, over the course of two weeks, to come to a final status agreement. Um, minorities of both sides, both Israelis and Palestinians, anger was growing, um, anger and, and the feeling of, of Israelis driving to Jericho to go to the casino when it was open there, um, you know, on their days off, or, you know, Arabs coming from, you know, the West Bank and Gaza into Tel Aviv, deep homeless in Tel Aviv, and everyone feeling comfortable, those days had, had, had gone, gone were, were bygone. And, and there's a, there a feeling of, of tension and something really building up um, uh, underneath. Um, and a concrete offer was made, right? A, 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 a offer that dealt with all the five core components, uh, the sticking points really of, of a negotiation um, when it comes to a final status agreement here, which are very quickly security, borders, uh, Palestinian right of return, who will be able to come uh, back to their homes um, uh, before um, the um, 1948 war. Jerusalem will be the status there, and then the settlements. Um, depending on who you ask who was present that day, uh, the, the uh, President Clinton uh, and his chief negotiator, Dennis Ross, famously blamed Arafat for uh, not being willing or not being um, able to, to bring himself to sign a deal that would um, that would um, set, um, that would accept uh, the reality as 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 it had uh, uh, played out. Um, others, other people who were there, blame the Israelis for for not dealing in, in good uh, favor. So, as everything in this story, it really is a question of, of who you're asking. Um, what we do know is there was a concrete deal for a state. There were the num the maps were drawn, the numbers were were played out, uh, the policies according to each thing were were there. Um, and the offer was rejected. It did not uh, did not come true. Um, there's a real real sense of disappointment at this. Um, and under the surface, there was a real growing anger. Um, and and um, it, this this the seven year period from 1993 to 2000 will end with a, with a lurch, with a real um, uh, um, the next the next few years will be extremely difficult for this region. Um, and so I want to stop there from 1993 to 2000 and just ask if there were any questions up until now, um, just before we move on to what we'll call the second intifada in a moment, just see if there's anything that can clear up in these first few minutes. Okay. So no one has, um, hang on, hello. No one has yet put questions in the chat. Friends, please feel free mm -hmm. to put your questions in the chat throughout the time. And then Josh, as he pauses in the middle, I'll Bring them forward. So, so I actually did. I actually received. There's a direct message to me. So I'll just read the, the question. Is even if a deal had been signed, would it have made a difference to any of the radical groups? Um, that's that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's really difficult for us, for me at least. Um, I think for us in 2022 20, today, to to look back at, at the time and and recognize that there certainly were um, parts uh, of both populations. Um, both uh, Jewish Israelis who uh, reject the partition of the land of greater Israel uh, and, and Palestinians whose vision is not a compromise with Israelis, but a vision where there is one state here that's a, a Palestinian state um, here in this land. Um, would there have been people opposed? Absolutely. Um, could the center have held um, when you're playing, you know, I find when you're playing sort of the what if history game, the answer can always be both yes um, and no. Like I said, I think um, Yitzhak Rabin was a, um, as all leader, all great leaders are, was was um, uniquely um, placed for that occasion. Um, call it fate, call it what have you. Um, but there's certainly no guarantee that something could have happened. Um, but certainly when when his presence was out, was gone from Israeli politics, 
there wasn't another leader that could um, hold, uh, at least on, from the Israeli perspective. And then again, you know, speaking for the, the Palestinian side, I feel less equipped to do so um, uh, off of occasions and, and knowing a little bit about the, the um, internal politics. Um, uh, we, all, we also should remember that um, the people who made peace in the Middle East um, both um, uh, Jewish, but also Arab. Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, who made peace with um, Israel, was was assassinated by by an Egyptian. Um, so people who make peace in the Middle East didn't um, weren't weren't made heroes in their lifetime. Uh, many times they were martyred. Um, and so um, it's an it's an excellent question. Um, I, you know, I think uh, would it have made a difference? Probably not. But could it have held? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But, but thank you. It was a great question. Um, so I'll just move into the, the 2000s because a lot to get through, and I really want to get us to today. So um, September of 2000, um, the the talks at Camp David have failed. There have been some symbolic steps forward, um, but it, it doesn't. Um, it's just um, it's just not not enough. Um, and and this feeling of um, of, of um, there, something's different, right? There, there's um, there, everyone knows that things have not gone well. Peace does not seem uh, imminent, and, and um, it seems that uh, at any moment things could break out into something violent, bring bring the situation back to the days of the first intifada. And um, sad, sadly, that's exactly what happens. Um, in September, on the left here, you see. I'm sorry, I'll move this here. Um, you see, um, then uh, member of Knesset, uh, former defense minister, and future prime minister Ariel Sharon visiting. Uh, the Haram el Sharif, if you're using the Islamic name, the Temple Mount, if you're using the Jewish name, um, the Al Aqsa Mosque. You can see the Dome of the Rock, famously, uh, famously, um, in, in the um, scene behind him. And he's the opposition leader at the time, and he visits the Temple Mount with really high tensions in the air. Right, really, it's, it's, it's electric. Anyone that's been to Jerusalem at a time with increased tensions can probably tell you about this feeling that really sits over the city. And Sharon, you need to remember that he's persona non grata for the Palestinians. He is abhorred over uh, the incidents at the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in Lebanon during the first Lebanon war, where a group of um, Marianite Christian Lebanese militia um, soldiers entered into a ref Palestinian refugee camp and, and murdered um, dozens of, of men, women, and children. Um, while Israel, Israel was not involved, um, their, Israel was controlling the territory at the time, and so the blame was, um, was is heavily placed by the Palestinians on Sharon, who was also, after an internal investigation in Israel, forced to resign uh, as the defense minister. Um, I only go off on that tangent to just remind everyone here that these, this, these things, you know, nothing that we're talking about has happened in a vacuum. These are all with, with huge, uh, most of these people that are, are players in this, in, in this ongoing drama are, are, have long passed in this, right? With statements and actions and, and, and they did this there and this there and, um, and, and both sides have long memories, right? And they hold these things, they hold these slights. Um, and, um, and this was, Ariel Sharon was, was using this moment to show that a Likud-led government, a right-wing government in Israel would never let a piece of Jerusalem um, get away, which was part, which as Likud said, was part of uh, the peace plan. It was not, but again, politics is politics. Um, everyone knew this would be pro provocative, but no one really could have imagined. Um, we spoke all the way back in the first class about um, Jerusalem being a flashpoint, about specifically Al-Aqsa, the Temple Mount being a flashpoint of this ongoing conflict. And we saw it, it was true in 1920, mentioned it very briefly, it was true in 1929, fast forward 100 years later, and we see this cry going out about the threat brought to bear by Israelis on um, uh, Haram al-Sharif, um, right, on the, the Temple Mount Plaza. And there is a, there is, there is a response to this, right? Uh, there's a, 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 a forceful response uh, by Palestinians in Jerusalem. Um, uh, that, that the very next day was a Friday, which is uh, the Holy Day in Islam, where thousands of uh, specifically uh, uh, men, but also women, show up to the Temple Mount to, to worship at Friday prayers. And it broke, riding opened out, and, and, and it, it 
it, it um, there's a phrase in Hebrew, it, it went over its banks, it, it, it just, the water overflowed, thank you, that's, I got to it in English too late, but it's, it, it um, I'm not, sorry, I'm not, not obviously laughing at, at the subject matter, I, uh, the, the riding breaks out on the, on the Temple Mount, stones are thrown from down the Temple Mount, down uh, worshipers at the Kotel, um, Israeli riot police rush the scene uh, and use, use force to, to break up this, this demonstration, um, there are injuries, there are, there are casualties. And, and the next day, there are just more and more incidents, uh, more and more places. And so from the epicenter of Jerusalem, it just breaks out across the West Bank and Gaza. And this, of course, is the events of the second intifada. Again, intifada is an Arabic word that means the shaking off, right? This is an attempt to um, um, uh, shake off the, the Israeli, what is seen by the vast majority of Palestinians as an Israeli occupation of Palestinian land. Um, the next four years are marked by really, uh, by, by increased violence, um, really a lot of on the street. Um, and the army is activated into a lot of areas where under Oslo they had been removed from. And unfortunately over the time, well, excuse me, that's, that's, that's uh, editorialism. Over that time, these places were, um, many of them, arms caches were built up and much of the violence that was being launched against Israeli soldiers and citizens was from these places. And so the Israeli army re-engaged with well-equipped um, forces all the time, uh, which um, brings in this modern type of, of asymmetric warfare um, where um, the coalition parties um, during the Iraq war experienced this um, once they were on the ground in Iraq. The Israeli army has been facing this uh, from the beginning where you're not facing off a, a, an arm or, or a uniformed combatant that um, behaves according to the Geneva Conventions, according to the rules of war. Um, for Israelis, the memory of, uh, of, of, the, sec of the Second Intifada are, are bus bombings. Um, we go from, um, there, there's something, there's um, over 40 suicide bombings in both 2001, um, two, and three. Um, it's, it's a horrible time where, where um, the, we, you know, the, the violence changes. We, the, for the first time we see, um, um, we see rockets launched uh, from, um, how can I unshare here? I've lost my ability to do that. Excuse me, I apologize. Maybe from here. Okay, I think I'm gonna share my screen. Um, um, where this, this changing uh, shape of the violence um, and uh, beyond the, the, the violence and casualties, the economies, both Israeli and Palestinian, both heavily dependent upon tourism are, are hugely affected. Um, the human casualties, over a thousand um, Israelis are killed. Um, that's the third most um, in severity of Israeli, Israel's armed conflicts generally. Only in the War of Independence and the Yom Kippur War were more um, Israeli soldiers, and these are citizens and soldiers. Um, over 4,500 Palestinians um, are killed during these years. Um, and these are really such large numbers that you have to remember that, that these are the, this is a very intimate experience for almost every Israeli and every Palestinian. Everyone has a personal story. I was almost there. Um, the, the rabbis who work at the congregation I grew up in were, were at uh, HUC doing their studies here in Jerusalem. They wanted to go to one restaurant that night. They went to another one just by chance at the one they were going to go to. Um, uh, a bomb went off. And so on each side of the conflict, there are all these stories near misses or um, very sadly not, not misses. Um, but the impacts of getting are beyond just, just economic the long-term impacts are there, there are several of them. Um, the first to speak about is physically, right? Geographically, this area changes because of this. The security barrier um, or security fence, uh, the separation wall, the separation barrier, or um, if your politics dictated, the apartheid wall is also used. Um, it started to be constructed in 2003. The wall is a deterrent um, is meant to be a deterrent against um, suicide bombers uh, because most of them um, would walk from um, one side of, especially Jerusalem, um, get on the uh, public transportation that would take them into part of the middle of part of the city um, and, then, and then would detonate there. Um, the wall was born as an idea to stop this, the 
stop the mobility of people from one side of the city moving into the other side of the city to access the rest of uh, the um, country. Um, as you can see here, this is part of the security barrier. Remember, this is, if we bring up the map here, you can see the, the red line outlines this. This is from 2011, so it's a bit dated. Um, but it's along the entirety of the West Bank, um, more or less to the spe specifications of the green line, the, uh, the armistice border between Israel and, and Jordan, but it also recognizes the reality of uh, many um, Israeli neighborhoods um, that are in, in Jerusalem and, and swings around to include them on uh, the Israeli side. Um, this this uh, project is 97% um, fence. It's a high, obviously high tech fence and, and quite um, um, quite um, uh, advanced. Um, and about four percent of it is, is concrete barrier, part of which you're seeing um, uh, here on the left. Um, from an Israeli perspective, as I said, it, it brings um, um, suicide bombings down. Right? You can look here as, as, it, as it sweeps around uh, Jerusalem. You can see this red alley. And we'll come back to this map next week um, when we talk about um, when we, when we uh, excuse me, two weeks um, before I'm corrected again. Um, um, but we'll see this again. You can see the the the, uh, the red is the barrier itself, um, cutting through Jerusalem, especially the eastern part of the city. Um, if for Israelis, this is experienced as a net positive. Most um, um, most um, uh, suicide bombings are are then prevented. Um, but for the Palestinians, it's a huge effect on their freedom of movement. Um, it cuts people off from their land, land that they had worked for, you know, perhaps decades or generations, or the wall would go between the person's lodging and their land. Um, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of cases brought to the Supreme Court of Israel in these disputes. Uh, the vast majority of them have been won by the complainant, um, and the wall has been moved, um, again, dozens, if not now hundreds of times to um, um, to fit the, the um, decisions of the, the Israeli Supreme Court. Um, so that's, that's geographically, there's this massive change, this, this whole new dynamic um, into, the, into the conflict, which also it, it, um, borders is a big question. We talked about it last week and it's coming back up again. It's a de facto border, right? It puts a physical thing between, right? What would be in a, uh, a two-state final status solution um, part of the Palestinian state, um, which is a uh, which is a meaningful um, change uh, in in when it comes to uh, visualizing and uh, experiencing uh, the conflict. Politically, Arafat again becomes enemy number one of Israel, um, and and the belief that there is even a partner um, for peace is is really shaken. Um, the Palestinian spirit of resistance is shaken, unlike the first Intifada, which is a real grassroots uprising. We know afterwards from statements from Arab leaders of all of all stripes that Arafat was in, very intensely engaged with planning the Second Intifada, carrying out the Second Intifada. Um, so this this very much had a, a feeling of top down in the Second Intifada, um, um, and, and much more equipped and high tech. And, and because of that, the the cost in, in human life was, was um, so much higher. Um, um, we can see as as the violence continues and more people are affected that more people um, are more uh, on the Palestinian side specifically are pulled towards groups other than Fatah, the mainstream Arafat's uh, political party that take an even a more strident stance um, towards Israel. Psychologically, I think um, this event is, is not at all well understood um, outside of Israel. Um, you know, we we in 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 you know that have lived the majority of our lives um, in the West. Um, you know, the, our experience of that same time is totally reshaped by 9/11, um, terror coming to North America, um, and uh, what get what most of what happened next, right? And I, I know that the things have happened over the course of the years, and, and there have been um, attacks, you know, um, carried out both in Europe and also in North America. The majority of what happened next happened thousands of miles away, right? The wars, specifically speaking from an American perspective, the wars in Afghanistan, the wars in Iraq. Uh, the next stage of that happens um, thousands of miles away for Israelis and Palestinians. There were four years um, um, of, of, of 
really um, of, of heightened pressure in everything that one did. And I have to contextualize this for myself from time to time, because when I think about myself in these same years, you know, I'm, I'm in middle moving towards high school. Uh, the Bush economy was really strong in the United States in the early aughts. Um, and I, you know, or, you know, I was, I was, you know, living, going to in the suburban St. Louis, Missouri to, to middle school um, and, and uh, in high school and, and my Israeli peers at the same age who are, you know, my age now, especially those living in Jerusalem, we're talking about things, where do we sit on the bus? Where can we be safest? Do we take the bus at all? Do we go to this restaurant? Do we not go to this restaurant? Um, how much, um, how much uh, chance, how much risk do we take upon ourselves? Um, and so these, these, the, the second intifada is still very much alive um, in, in the Israeli memory. Um, and, and I think that it's, um, uh, I, th I think it's one of those, much like the Arab revolt we spoke about in our first session together, I think it's one of those things that, that we don't speak about enough when it comes to understanding the sort of the psychology around um, um, the conflict uh, uh, um, in, when it comes to um, events and how it affects behavior even decades down the line. Um, question came in saying during the Second Intifada, which um, countries are arming the Palestinians? Um, <clears throat> I need to look, um, I'd, I'd want to look to say definitely. Um, at that point in the early 2000s, Libya has become a close, close ally of the Palestinians. I'm sure that um, um, Gaddafi um, was, was um, helping. Um, other, um, um, beyond that, I can't say with any sort of certainty, but I'll, I'll, I'll jot that down and I'll send that information along. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, and I just don't want to speak um, out of hand. Um, and Rabbi, if there's anything else that came in, it's a good time to take a breath here. And if not, then we'll just uh, keep on no, moving. because People have realized they could uh, chat with you directly. So yeah. you, you're getting Perfect. all the questions forward. Perfect. All right. Um, so um, 2000 to 2004, really the height of the second intifada. Um, and again, uh, some decisions are, are, are taken in 2005 that really changed the shape of the conflict again. The same Ariel Sharon that I mentioned earlier, this uh, provocateur in many ways, um, this, uh, this, this image of, of uh, never apologizing and uh, this, this long-term military career um, defiant, you know, standing up for, as he saw it, the security of Israel. Um, he's, he's elected in, uh, in 2001, a few months into the Intifada, He's elected prime minister overwhelmingly. Um, it's the last time that a direct um, election is held. Uh, there's a quick time in Israeli politics where instead of you voting, you voted also for a party and also for a person. Um, he won almost 70% of the popular vote, um, which is uh, quite, uh, um, it's quite an accomplishment. Um, and he runs a, a policy on tough towards terror, stopping the intifada. Um, you know, he's known as a hawk in, in, every, in every which way. And as time passes, his approach to the conflict changes over, over these few years. And at the time, one of the most important considerations for many in, in, in the political um, sphere are, are, is, was the demographic question. Being, if we don't have a Jewish majority in this area, we won't have a Jewish state. And so this sort of, this, this thought, this, this ideology brings Sharon um, around to the idea that Israel needs to take some unilateral steps. Bilateral steps have failed. There's no one to speak to with the Palestinians. So what Israel is going to do, because we're coming up against a demographic disaster, we're going to do things to show our goodwill, right? The idea that it will, we um, will implement this idea of land for peace, um, and it will um, it will strengthen Israel's position in the Middle East. Um, so he proposes uh, what's called in, in Hebrew the hitnat kut, the um, disengagement from the Gaza Strip and the northern uh, West Bank. What's, um, the, the idea is that every Israeli, both civilian and military, would be removed from uh, these, these places, would be compensated with homes and housing in, in Israel uh, um, in, within the 48 uh, borders. Um, and this would be a step towards implementing uh, some sort of long-term uh, peace. Um, caused all sorts of uh, internal shakeup and, and political drama that we don't have time for, unfortunately. Um, but 
to make a very long story short, and, and in, um, you can there's a there's a movie on YouTube. It's called Disengagement that uh, brings together clips of of that time here. You can really see what a what a a, um, a trying um, few days this was, especially for young Israeli soldiers, 18, 19, 20 years old, removing Jewish people, Jewish Israelis from their homes that they had built or or started or these communities, their synagogues. Um, it's really um, it's a really heart-wrenching uh, visual to see. Um, but by September 2005, all Israelis are out of the Gaza Strip, um, which leaves a power vacuum in, in, in the, in the um, Gaza Strip. Yasser Arafat had just recently died. Uh, in 2004, he passes away, which leads to a power vacuum also in Fatah, right? This, this, this symbol of the Palestinian resistance movement has, uh, has, has passed. And there's no one with the same amount of uh, charisma uh, as uh, Arafat to come in and, and shore that up. Um, there's an election held in 2006 in the Gaza Strip with Hamas winning pretty decidedly. Um, and from January of 06 until June of 2007, there's this tension between Fatah and Hamas with fighting uh, breaking out. Um, in June 2007, there's a two week, um, there's a, a civil war for lack of a better term where uh, the Fatah political leadership are um, are um, uh, removed. Um, most of them are killed, and some of them are banished from the Gaza Strip, and Hamas completely takes over. And that's been the situation there since June of 07. Shortly after, um, about a week and a half later, um, if you all remember an incident where a young man in Gilad Shalit, um, who is a, a, a tank soldier in the Israel in the IDF, was kidnapped. Um, and held in captivity for years. Um, and so around this event, the first conventional fighting breaks out between the IDF and Hamas, and which brings us to a pattern that continues to the state. More on that soon. Um, uh, one last thing historically, and then we'll really spend the last, uh, our last time today talking very much about where we are today. So in spite of the change in status in Gaza with the disengagement, um, the lack of implementation of a peace plan um, uh, that, you know, uh, after um, the Oslo and after Camp David, um, in January of 2006, as Sharon, Ariel Sharon, is putting into uh, place his plan to continue disengaging from these territories, um, he has a stroke. Um, he's put into a coma. He stays on life support for several years, but um, he, he's no longer um, uh, prime minister, no longer part of Israeli politics. Um, and uh, he had managed right before he passed to create this new big tent center political party called Kadima, meaning forward in Hebrew. And the momentum that he had brought with him brings Ehud Olmert, his number two in the party, to win that election, to form a government. And with the center left government, with another um, with, with another mandate to seek peace again. Um, this time he engages Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, uh, more on the show and later, um, really engages all sorts of multi-layer layer diplomatic talks, coming to the point where we even have um, a napkin on which Abbas in his own handwriting was sketching out a map. Um, I'll put the article in, uh, in the resource sheet that I'm preparing to share with uh, Rabbi Landsberg at the end of this to, for people who want to keep reading. Um, but it's, but really, I mean, we're talking like, again, like there is a, there is a plan laid out, discussed and parameters, um, set. Um, we don't know what happened behind closed doors. Of course, both sides blame the other, uh, for not decision, for no decision being made at the time. Um, last year, um, maybe seven or eight months ago, um, Ehud Olmert, who was prime minister at the time and deeply involved in these negotiations, claims that in, in conversations with Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president to this day, uh, afterwards in the years following, um, Abbas has admitted to him personally that he regrets not signing an agreement. Again, that's one party in the negotiation saying something about the other party that they've not admitted, but um, you know who's to say? Um, but again, um, 2008, there's a peace proposal made and, and uh, nothing, nothing, is, nothing is achieved. Okay, so I want to just take a second here, because what we're going to do is we're going to change modes. Up until now, we've really been speaking historically, things that um, I had a, a beloved history professor in college that um, wouldn't ever discuss anything that happened more than 10 years ago, or excuse me, less than 10 years ago in a history forum, because not enough has been, not enough is understood, not enough time has passed. 
And so what we're going to do now is we're going to move in from uh, what this professor would say was the realm of history and sort of um, into more current events. Um, and it's going to it's going to sound a little bit different because nothing, you know, even though we are obviously still debating the past and, um, you know, trying to um, argue about the past, right? Uh, many of the things we have, like, the things that I've tried to present here are, are things that are set, uh, that are um, standard, that are, that are known, that we can verify, um, which is what history seeks to do. Now we're moving to, to current events where um, some, of it, some of this will um, need to be uh, that, uh, uh, there'll be a little bit of editorial here. Um, and I certainly don't mean to um, insert my own opinion. I, I try what I do to prepare. I try to listen and read as many smart people as I can, and then take a little bit from here and there and, and come at it uh, and, and come present to you all this information. Um, really quickly before we move into that, um, Ron, uh, you asked the question, do you believe that Hamas and the PLO need to come together before we can ever achieve a two-state solution? Um, we're going to talk about that very last thing here. It's a great question, and, and I'll definitely get back to that um, right as, as we're about to end today. So um, again, where, where we are today, we're, we're in a phase of the conflict that has been described, um, and I'll reference this again later, what's in, in what's called the no solution solution phase. Um, while there has been conceptual agreement over the years about things um, at, at some point about certain concepts, there's never been a practical application plan that's been followed through by both sides to, to bring us to some sort of agreement. So, and so for years, right, really since, from my perspective, this is me from since really 2008, because um, the multilateral talks that happened during the Obama administration between um, the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't think anyone had any great deal of confidence that anything was gonna bear fruit from that. Um, that again, that might be me uh, Monday morning quarterbacking from that, but I, I was, living here in Israel during that year. And I remember the intensity of coverage that it had. Everyone was hyper-focused, but um, optimism was not uh, typically the, the messaging. Um, and so we're in this sort of status quo, this somewhat holding pattern uh, since the late 2000s. Um, so historically, right, when we talked about, if we're, if, if we're working, looking at this conflict from the framework of we, we, we're, we, we want to come to some sort of equitable um, solution. Um, and part of that means um, to separate the land in some way, separate the people and separate the states. Again, that's not, you don't all have to agree with me um, uh, that that's the correct political direction forward, but this is how um, the framework that, that I'm going to present this in, that if we look back at what, what was considered an amicable settlement in the 30s and 40s when we talked about partition, that reality has then changed, right, through the 48 war, right? Those, those maps are no longer valid. Israel has, in, in a war of, of, of uh, primarily defense, Israel has captured more territory than it was offered, and Israel feels no obligation to give that back. So the reality has changed. That shifts into what, what we, you know, we, we learn as the two-state solution, that which has been popular for, for decades. And, and, and today, that situation, uh, Ron, to your question earlier, Many times it doesn't seem to lend itself. And again, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just trying to, you know, present more frameworks of how to, to think about events happening here. Where there, we're really living in, um, at least in, in my reading of it, a, a three-state reality is what, is what we're living with now. Those states being Israel, um, West Bank, the area is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, and the Gaza Strip controlled by Hamas. So what I want to do is run through a little bit some, some again, bullet points and information to try to frame where each of these players is um, with regards to one another. Um, and um, which will get us to the context of, you know, where, what's happening today, where we can really dive into these deeper questions uh, um, next week. So the first state that I'll speak about um, is Israel. Um, Today, when you speak to Israelis, when you when you think about ask them, you know, two state solution, all these things, um, the public support is not at an all time high at the moment, but it's also not at an all time low. Um, a a minority of Israeli Jews support a two state solution, minority, right, less than fifty percent, um, <clears throat> and with a much higher percent um, favoring a a remaining of the status quo. Um, 
now that's this is these are one or two uh, surveys you can buy into them uh, what you will um, but I think it's safe to say that when you take that when you look at it from um, you know calling um, Israelis you know above the age of 18 asking you know what your background is and what, what do you think about these issues but then if you move to politics um, if you look at voting patterns for Israel in the past four elections, and we've gotten very good at holding elections here, um, most parties that make up the Israeli Knesset, putting aside who's in the government and who's not at the moment, most of these parties oppose most, if not all, territorial um, uh, compromises with Palestinians. So you know, if, if we use these two things um, uh, together, you know, public uh, opinion surveys and also politics, you know, it starts to paint a picture of where uh, the majority Israeli is at, right? When you look at the, 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 uh, the, the average Israeli voter, the vast majority of is Israeli parties in the past four elections have voted for parties that are in what I would call the center right when it comes to issues of national security. Um, while some of them are more optimistic about peace, less optimistic for peace, everyone is very, um, is, is, security is the name of the game um, in, in Israel. Um, speaking of politics, the past three years especially, I mean, it is really volatile um, in politics here. And that's talking in terms of Israeli politics, which is never short of, of fun and, uh, and uh, um, uh, say, uh, fireworks. Um, uh, if, if you know where to look. Um, the past three years have been um, incredibly hectic, incredibly um, uh, uncertain. And while the current government is stabilized since its uh, inception in um, um, ooh, uh, July, I believe, of last year, um, the coalition itself, the government, it's too politically diverse. There's too many different opinions on what to do about uh, the Palestinian question. Then, uh, then, then are able to make any sort of proactive moves. So there have been some interesting things, and I want to mention that. Um, one is there is under this government there's more willingness to transfer funds to the Palestinian Authority. Israel is is um, responsible for collecting taxes on behalf of the Palestinian Authority and transferring them to. Um, um, uh, to uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, and in um, previous years, uh, those funds have been withheld. We'll talk about why. Uh, but uh, this government has has helped move along these funds a little bit quicker in pace. Um, we've seen high level meetings happen. Um, very uh, to we woke up uh, a couple months ago to headlines in Israel that Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, had been in. Benny Gantz's home, the Minister of Defense, in a city called Rosh Ayn, which is a city uh, just uh, really just east of, of Tel Aviv, and it's this this suburban center that it's filling up with young families and uh, people from high tech and and really mixed. This very Israeli uh, city, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas is hosted at uh, at Benjamin Gantz's house. Nothing. This wouldn't have happened uh, years ago. So you, while uh, while the Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has said he will not hold any consultations uh, with um, with Mahmoud Abbas, um, there the the um, relationship between the governments is clearly stronger. Um, uh, oh, well, I'll mention that in a second. Um, you know, as I mentioned, security is really the name of the game for for Israel. Um, there's still a lot of threats that are faced here and felt um, from Gaza in the form of rockets. Um, from and from cross uh, border from the West Bank into Israel proper, um, excuse me, I'll call it the 48 Israel, the 48 borders. And there are still acts of violence carried out against Israeli citizens and soldiers. According to the Shin Bet, Israel's FBI, uh, over the last three years, each year more than 400 terror attacks have been stopped before they were carried out by uh, the Israel Security Services. Um, most Israelis live under the range of rocket fire, um, primarily for the past decade. It's been experienced in Sterot, in the area around um, the Gaza Strip. But up north as well, remember, um, Hezbollah is, is firmly entrenched in Lebanon, and they'll come up more next week. Um, and, they're, and they've made some noise as well. Uh, so is, is, Israelis live with this, this knowledge. Um, but beyond the conflict and its sort of sporadic presence in Israelis' lives, the last decade has been 
really prosperous for Israel. Um, you know, it's not a Garden of Eden, of course, but Israelis over the past decade, really the past two decades, have been consistently ranked some of the happiest people in the world, uh, despite the challenges uh, here. Uh, one of the big reasons for that, uh, one of the feelings of, feeling, of, of being less constrained here in the Middle East is that as the Abraham Accords that were signed in August of 2020, which normalized relations between the UAE, Israel, and, um, and Bahrain, um, it, I mean, it, I, I, this is my personal feeling. I feel like a, a big enough deal has not been made about this. Um, the idea that I can get on a plane here and fly across Saudi airspace into Dubai you know, again, if you would ask me four years ago, I would have, I would have uh, sort of laughed at you. But, but this is, you know, if something has changed in the Middle East. It's clear what it has, right? Um, Iran, who is now, uh, who is a, an, an adversary both of Israel's but also of many of the Gulf states, as the threat of Iran becomes much larger than any sort of, um, you know, ideological or political um, price that uh, these countries would pay for for relations with Israel, um, who is, by the way, even in places where it's not loved is known for its strength and its technology and its power and is seen as a useful ally. Um, I recommend for all of you um, to go read in the next few months a book by the name, uh, it's called Trump's Peace by an Israeli um, um, journalist named Barak Ravid. It'll be released in English. Um, and for those of you who like podcasts, there's a podcast called How It Happened. Um, where there are several episodes discussing how this piece came about. It's an incredibly interesting process. But what's happened is, um, and this is probably the biggest takeaway from the Abraham Accords, is that for the longest time, uh, Western diplomats and sort of the, the general understanding was that in order to solve the Palestinian issue, right, you, excuse me, in order to, for Israel to make peace with its Arab neighbors, it would need to solve the Palestinian issue, and the Arab countries would follow with normalization. But that paradigm was shattered by the Abraham Accords. Both the United Arab Emirates, as I mentioned, Bahrain had jumped on and said, listen, there's nothing final about the Palestinians question, but we're ready, right, to, ready to normalize. It's a huge, uh, huge breakthrough. Um, so that's, again, just a few, um, few data points about Israel. Um, and again, not a Garden of Eden, but um, certainly a, a prosperous last decade, decade and a half. Second state, we talked about three states. The second state is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, the Palestinian Authority has civilian control over about, um, 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 has about, is controlling around 40% of the land within the West Bank, talking about areas A and B, as I mentioned earlier, um, and complete sovereignty in 11% area A. And the leadership in the Palestinian Authority, which is a, which is a parliamentary body, is dominated by the political party Fatah. That was founded by Yasser Arafat, among, amongst others. This is his party, a mythical uh, piece of, of Palestinian uh, liberation movement. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas um, is president of the Palestinian Authority. Um, he was elected 16 years ago to a five-year term. Um, I'm not a big math guy, but I know that those numbers don't exactly add up one to one. Um, no elections have been held um, in the past um, uh, 16 years in the Palestinian Authority. Most recently, for a number of reasons, but most recently in May of this year, there were supposed to be elections um, that were canceled. Um, according to Abbas, uh, the uh, reason was that Israel was not going to allow Palestinians living in East Jerusalem um, to vote in the elections. Um, Israel denied that that is the case. Um, again, these are things that are playing out in the news, and I, you know, I, I can't say one way or the other for certain. Um, but many people have speculated it's also because in any, in any legislative election where Fatah faced off against Hamas, Hamas has a good chance of winning, winning resoundingly in that election, which would be um, disastrous in the eyes of Palestinians who are working, looking, uh, see their future by normalizing relations with Israel in a two-state solution, potentially, and between Palestinians who say, there is no hope for a two-state solution, right? We can't, we can't deal with these Israelis. They don't want us here. They're not dealing in good faith, so we need to find uh, a different answer. Um, within, the, within these areas, um, security is, is um, 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 handled by the Palestinian security forces. Um, they response there, both the police force and the army within this area, they are, uh, they work very closely with Israel, they're supplied by Israel, um, and they are really, while they're, the police force, I said, they're really a tool of the Fatah party to maintain order in the West Bank. Um, we've heard in the past few months of incidents of um, 
Fatah arresting Hamas operatives in the West Bank. Um, so there you go. You have you have uh, in this incredibly complex reality that is what's happening in the West Bank. You have um, the Israelis telling the Palestinian the Fatah party, uh, the Palestinian Authority, to arrest a Hamas, also Palestinian, and then sometimes uh, hold them themselves, and then other times turn them over to Israel. Um, it's a very it's it's layered and complex, and, and, it, and it can get um, um, down downright um, yeah downright ugly on the ground from time to time. Um, a huge amount of funding comes, as I said, from the tax uh, tax revenue that's collected from Israel, also foreign aid, the United Nations, um, and uh, Western countries. And a huge sum has been withheld of these tax payments because it is the policy of the Palestinian Authority to fund the families of um, uh, individuals who have died as martyrs that have carried out attacks either against Israeli security forces or civilians. Uh, these families receive a, receive a stipend from the government um, every month. Um, that was one of the reasons um, that some of the funds were withheld. The other reason is that the Israeli electric company is responsible for supplying all the electricity to the, to the Palestinian Authority. Um, there is a claim that that bill was not paid, and uh, so the, some of the funds were held. Um, during the past few years, uh, the, the Palestinian situation has been such where they've been somewhat cut off from um, uh, the, the goings on when it comes uh, to to the conflict. Um, they boycotted the Trump administration, would have nothing to do with them, um, uh, which is interesting because in the Trump's peace book, which you really need to read, uh, it talks about how um, allegedly former President Trump was talking about uh, how told Barack Ravi, this reporter, that it was actually Abbas who wanted peace and Netanyahu was the one who stood in the way of any sort of peace. Anyway, it's fascinating. Please go out and read it. It's a, it's a very, very well told story. Um, and, uh, where was I? Okay, so um, there. So all these things in the past years, again, the Abraham Accords was incredibly difficult for them, right? Um, Arab allies for years, normalizing with Israel, not waiting for for the Palestinians' um, uh, objections and and uh, and, um, and and issues to be to be solved. Um, in the in the West Bank, there's nearly three million Palestinians living. Um, about two and a half million of them live under the PA. Um, the rest are in Area C under Israeli control. Um, their mobility is very limited uh, in the West Bank. It's uh, tightly controlled who has access into Israel at all, who can cross. There's a series of checkpoints, some of them permanent, some of them temporary. Um, and there is a, a very high level of education, something like 70% or more, uh, a little bit higher than 70% of Palestinians. In the West Bank have master's degree or at least a bachelor's degree, many of them uh, with secondary uh, higher education degrees, um, and, but also a very high level of employment. It, it climbed up to 20% even higher during the Corona times um, as the economy is completely um, wrapped up in, in Israel's economy as well. Um, and uh, Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas, the president is 86 years old. Um, we, we, we don't, you know, uh, no, no human being lives forever and we don't know what will happen in the wake of that. Um, he certainly set up around him uh, a crowd of loyal um, advisors and supporters um, with the vision to keep Fatah rule moving forward. But um, as we know, things in the Middle East can change very quickly. Um, I see we have about, uh, again, we'll sort of use my 75 minutes rather than 60 minute limit here just because there's, as you, have, you know, those of you who joined me these past few, there's just so much to tell. Um, and so I wanted to say a few words about the third state, and that's Gaza. Um, Hamas has been firmly in control of uh, the Gaza Strip since uh, the middle of 2007. Um, Hamas is an entity. It does not uh, recognize Israel. Uh, it does not engage directly with Israel in any sort of negotiations surrounding issues. Um, in this very small piece of land, there's nearly 2 million uh, individuals um, living primarily in three built-up um, metropolitan areas, Gaza City, um, uh, Khan Yunus, and Rafah, which are both near the south. Um, Gaza City, which is in the northern part of the, the Gaza Strip. Um, <clears throat> it's also a very young population. Um, there's about 2.1 million people there. Uh, One million are under the age of 21. It's a very, very young population. Um, internally, as I said, everything is run by Hamas. The borders of the Gaza Strip are patrolled by either Israel, where that's the land border that's shared, on the land border that's shared with Egypt, 
that border is also shut. Both Egypt and um, Israel patrol the maritime border. So anything that goes in and out of the Gaza Strip is either checked by Egyptian security forces or, beg your pardon, um, by um, Israeli security forces. This is one of the interesting parts of this past decade where this, uh, where Israel and Egypt have become, have grown very close one, one to the other, especially when it comes to security. Um, President al-Sisi and, and his regime are, are very uh, aligned with Israel and their security goals. They're very distrustful of Hamas, which remember is a break off of the um, Muslim Brotherhood, um, who uh, the president, um, whose name I'm going to forget, um, before uh, al-Sisi, who al-Sisi deposed as president um, uh, when he was commander of the army and then was elected president, um, there's no love lost between him and the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and the movement of, thing, of, of, of goods in and out, right? This also is the same story with people. It's very difficult to get in and out of the Gaza Strip. Um, you need a special permit to go into Egypt or Israel. Uh, very few exceptions to receive a permanent Israel. Uh, most of the time it's um, uh, humanitarian, so health, um, but uh, things like uh, deaths in the family or things like that very, very infrequently are, are, um, are passes granted to get in from Gaza to Israel. Uh, the vast majority of the funding for the Gaza Strip is, is um, brought in by uh, the United Nations, specifically UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. If you're not familiar, this is a, um, ah, Mohamed Morsi was the president of Egypt. Thank you very much um, for, for the reminder. Um, the United Nations, the UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency is a special refugee um, board, a special refugee organization within the United Nations that works only with Palestinian refugees. If you're a refugee um, of any other type from any other conflict, you fall under the other, um, uh, under the, um, um, uh, this other uh, refugee body. Again, we talked about that, and when we talked about 48 was the sort of the unique nature that the Palestinian refugee uh, issue has taken on, uh, specifically because it has these um, um, specifications that only work, count for Palestinian refugees. Um, do the majority of the Palestinians want Hamas to be the governing party in Gaza? Um, you can't do opinion polling because um, that can be very dangerous for the individual. Um, not only are, are Hamas considered a terrorist organization by the United Kingdom, Canada, the EU, Israel, Japan, and the United States, um, they're also very, uh, it's a totalitarian regime. They, they, are, they know they are everywhere. They're in every part of the government, in every part of society. Um, so it's hard to say whether the people want them. There was a really interesting um, event in the past two weeks where there was for the first time a mass online protest against Hamas on social media, which managed to take hold in Gaza before they shut it down. Um, so I would suggest Googling it. It's a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing that happened. Um, and we have no idea what will come. Who, who's to say? Again, things can move very fast here in the Middle East. Um, um, just one more word about UNRWA. This is an organization that operates schools and other charitable organizations in the in the Gaza Strip. Um, but of course, everything that happens in Gaza happens with Hamas's permission. Um, Hamas is supported by Iran. That's their big sponsor. That's where they get uh, a majority of their high tech weapons from. Um, there, it's it's a it's a it's a repressive government in every in every sense. Um, if communications with Israel are punished um, by law, um, jail, maybe even worse. Um, any sort of, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a, I saw it described the, the law system in Hamas is, is basically whatever Hamas says. It's a, it's a loose interpretation of a sort of conservative stream of, of um, Sharia law, Muslim law when it comes to social things. But then it's also, it's, it's about Hamas and Palestinian liberation and, and working towards that, um, working towards that goals. And for the past years, there's been cyclical violence between Hamas and the other armed factions, um, even more uh, um, uh, dedicated to the Palestinian liberation, to, to say it lightly. Um, since 2008, we've had four major cycles, 08, 09, 2012, 2014, most recently, 2021, um, Shomer Homot, um, protector of the walls, I think it was called in English. Um, if you remember last summer, uh, the uptick of uh, rockets um, and, and fighting in, in Gaza. We'll get more into that next week. Don't worry, because it's obviously central to what we're talking about. Um, but again, I, I just want um, to, to bring up um, something that I meant to say a bit more about today is 
is the challenge of asymmetric warfare, right? The, the um, and, and we'll talk next week about the visual, right? How, how we consume the conflict from afar. Uh, it plays a huge role in, on um, um, how we talk about it and how we understand it, the language we use, um, where, um, you know, Israel is, no one is, no one can argue that Israel is not the more powerful of the two military powers in this equation. You know, there's no, there's no arguing about that. Um, the, the problem happened, the, the, the issue, the, well, some of the issues, the immediate, um, uh, complexity happens because it's caused by the population density of, of, of Gaza, the tactics of, of Hamas, um, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll dive into a little bit more of that in that into in next week's uh, next week excuse me two weeks from now's session. Um, all negotiations with Hamas are done with the moderator. Uh, in Egypt uh, again becoming more of a force in the Middle East again, or Qatar, um, who is styles themselves as a neutral party in the Middle East. Uh, well, everyone knows that they're quite well funded by Iran or anyone else that wants to, to fund them, of course. Um, and uh, their and their um, uh, media outlet, media outlet Al Jazeera, um, uh, takes a, a very clear position on uh, uh, Middle East issues. Um, and um, you know the the cycle. It, well, hold on. So I. I, with only two minutes left here, and I thank you everyone for your patience and your time. I really appreciate it. I just want to sum up everything we did today because uh, I know it's a lot. There's so much information here, but I, but I want to sum up in two, two really three sentences. I want to read you um, a quick uh, um, a piece that I found today that I think really sort of sets up what I'm trying to, um, what I was, the story that I was trying to, to tell you um, today. So we looked at the peace process today, and what started as the peace process or the peace process somewhat faltered. Uh, the progress was made in, in the agreements that, again, they had principle, right? They, there was some agreement on principle, but it lacked the, the, a, a realistic process of implementation um, from both, both sides. Um, the last, in the last 30 years, the realities of the conflict um, and, and, uh, have, uh, uh, have shifted to where, um, you know, perhaps there's new room and, and creativity for thought about solutions. Um, and as we mentioned, I mentioned before today, you know, the word that I, that I I've, I've latched onto is the, the no solution solution. Um, and in a piece um, that's called, uh, it's, it's a, a think tank, uh, it's a think tank called the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, which um, apparently is a, quite a well-known think tank, if that's a world that you move in. Um, and a report by a gentleman named Anthony Kordsman, uh, which, which really uses this language of the no solution solution. Um, and I just want to read just a, 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 a couple of pieces here um, to, to, um, to wrap up everything we did today. So um, it's all too clear from an analysis of the scale of the military, security, and economic problems on all sides that even seemingly successful efforts in the current fighting, meaning the fighting in May, may not lead to a more uh, to more than a pause in further violence. It's also clear that no settlement is likely to last that ignores the fact that the two-state solution has so far failed because both sides can sometimes agree on a concept but can never agree on effective practical action. Lasting success can only come from creating and then actually implementing a credible plan to deal with all of the key issues that now divide Israeli Jews and Palestinians, to end the armed race between Israel and Hamas, to focus on development and human progress, to give all Palestinians hope for a better, better life and real equality, if not a formal capital in Jerusalem or the prospect of a separate state. Um, skipping down a little bit, um, um, you know, he goes on to say, you know, there's so many external factors that we need to take um, uh, into account that, you know, some, some dis, uh, dis destabilizing power, um, you know, like an Iran or a Turkey would add to the issues, but he sums up in this, uh, sentence, which is both, I think, um, hopeful, but, but very much catches the spirit of, of it, what's going on in the street right now when it comes on, the, when it comes to the conflict, where it says it's written, one should never give up hope, but history warns that the no solution solution to the present crisis seems likely to be the most probable real world outcome of the violent tragedy in May, 2021. The idea that uh, non-action is, uh, is um, and, and the willingness to, to not create inertia towards something, anything 
um, is according to this analysis, um, keeping us in this no solution situation. So thank you for letting me go a few minutes over. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Lee. Thank you all of you um, for your one um, um, questions um, and uh, for your wonderful questions and, and, and uh, everything. And I really, 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 really am looking forward to this session two weeks now because you all have really shaped um, what, I, what, what I'll bring and what I'll discuss and, and um, have challenged me. And it's been, it's been really great. So I'm looking forward to it um, and wishing everyone a Shavuot Tov. Uh, maybe a week of health, and um, we'll, meet again, we'll meet again soon. And for you, Josh, um, connecting with Canadian Jews means, or at least on for those of us here in Ontario, you should take next Monday off as a statutory holiday. It is a long weekend for us here, which is why we are holding off, I have to remember, two weeks from now. Wonderful. It does Wonderful. give us, actually, a lot of time, friends, Josh has, you have brought us a lot of history. And as you say, we're moving now to a point where it's not history, it's um, current news and current open questions. Friends, if there are questions you want Josh to reflect on and bring into our conversation next week, stick. We have two weeks, which means if you don't mind spending this week thinking of your questions, emailing them to me, I will forward them all on directly to Josh. So he has opportunity to reflect on them and shape our conversation two weeks from this Sunday. I do hope everyone has a wonderful two-week interim. Josh, again, as always, thank you so much. Friends, see you next time. This will be posted on the Emmanuel website later today or tomorrow, in case you want to review any of the three lectures so far, we've got them all up for you to look at or to share with those who are interested who weren't able to join us. So thank you. Thank you, Arts of Canada. Thank you, Josh. See everybody soon.